Amen. Well, let's look in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I was thinking we are talking about gravity releasing us. Well, that'll be a blessing. All this skin on my eyes will go up. I want to share a message about a call to glory and virtue. And before we read the scriptures, I'd like to have a word of prayer. Wes Gold called me this afternoon, and his mother is not doing well. Most likely she's going to be going home to be with the Lord. And so if we can pray for Wes and his family, I know he'd appreciate that. And uh, uh, pray for his mother. Amen. So let's, let's go to God in prayer right now. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to uh, be together tonight. Uh, what, what joy it's been to be in the house of God and sing these precious songs that, that stir our hearts with joy and fills us with hope. And Lord, so we, we want to pray for Wes and his uh, uh, family, Lord. Uh, especially want to pray for his mother right now, Lord. I know she's in your hands and uh, God... Uh, your timing in life and in death is always right and precious. But God, it, it, it hurts. It aches the heart many times. And so I pray that you encourage Wes right now, encourage his family. Uh, be to them the God of all comfort uh, that comforts us in all of our tribulations. And I pray that you might encourage them tonight and strengthen them. God, we pray that you might speak to our hearts in a special way as we study the word together tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's read 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in uh, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it me, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. What a great passage of Scripture here to be able to experience a move and an anointing of God. You know, Peter mentions two great things in this passage. He mentions divine power. Notice we see that in verse 3. He says, according as his divine power. But then he also mentions divine nature. Down in uh, verse 4, he says that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. And I think sometimes when we're living our Christian life and we're dealing with issues and struggles and things in life, we forget that God has so designed us to live by divine power that develops a divine nature in us. 
And so that's why Paul would write and said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And uh, certainly uh, he would write that for whom the Lord did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed in the image of his son. And there is a transformation that takes place uh, in the Christian life uh, as we walk with God and we believe God and trust God and grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see in this passage uh, the confidence of Peter. It's amazing that when Jesus had warned Peter, you're going to deny me three times, we don't see much confidence when Peter, when he's gathered around the fire, when Jesus is being interrogated. But now as he's writing to the believers and he acknowledges the fact that his departure is at hand, he has great confidence in the Lord. Look at verse 9 and 10. It says, But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, giving all diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. The confidence of Peter. How confident are you as you live your Christian life that the way you're living, the way you're responding to the word of God, you're not going to stumble and fall? Every one of us are susceptible to falling in our Christian life. But how confident that we can be that if we hold on to the things of God, we acknowledge that our old life, our old sins have been purged out of us, so they no longer have a hold on us. We acknowledge those things that with a great confidence that we can be assured of the fact that we are saved, secured for all eternity, and we need not fall by the wayside. So we see the confidence of Peter. We see in verse 11 and 12, the commitment of Peter. In verse 11 it says, For so an interest shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the presence of uh, present truth. And so we see the commitment of Peter. He said, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to make sure I give you and communicate everything to you that's possible to be able to strengthen you in your faith, to be able to be uh, living your life for the glory of God. You know, Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 20 that he held back nothing that was necessary for the believers. What a great truth it is to be able to see the commitment of Peter and the Apostle Paul in instructing the people of God uh, to help them and assure them of what God's will and way is in their life. I'm thankful for the faithfulness of men that are committed to preaching the Word of God. I thought about, often think about Dr. Malone. He really had an impact on my life. I got saved and a year later I was in Bible college and for four years I was under his ministry. But I just was moved by the fact that every time I think about it, his schedule, I mean, when I went to Bible college, he was 66 or 67 years old. So uh, he's about my age. He's a young guy, amen. <laughs> and uh, uh, he would preach uh, Sunday morning, Sunday school in the morning, Sunday night, Monday and Tuesday. He would always fly somewhere to go speak in a conference on Monday night and then on Tuesday. He would fly home on Wednesday and preach in Emmanuel Baptist Church on Wednesday night. Uh, Thursday night, he would be over at the church to go out door-to-door -door soul winning. And uh, on Fridays, he would be up at the college to teach a course at college. And then Saturday, be out soul winning and then preach again on Sunday. That was his schedule every week. Every week. And I often thought about the commitment to be, to, to be studying enough to produce the messages. To have the stamina enough to be able to keep traveling from one place to another. And in the process of never abandoning or drifting away from the foundational truths that are in the word of God. You know, Paul and Peter showed us that there, we can not only have a confidence in God to keep us strong and standing. But we can have a commitment that challenges one another to continue on for the Lord. 
Then in verse 13 and 14, I see the courage of Peter. In verse 13 says, Yea, I think it me, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Uh, the courage of Peter in the hour of facing the end of his life. His heart's desire was to be an encouragement to someone else. In the hour of knowing that his life would be quickly taken away from him, he had courage enough to still stand for God and instruct others in the word of God. And so he had great courage to go on for God. So when he writes to us about divine power, it gets my attention. When he writes to us about having a divine nature, it gets my attention. Because if anybody illustrated for us what it means to live in accordance with a divine power and a divine nature, it certainly was the Apostle Peter. What a great man of God that we can learn from. He states here in verse 3 that uh, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. He makes a couple, he has another couple of words here that he connects together and glory and virtue. We must understand what glory is. Glory in the New Testament is always that which has a good opinion concerning one individual or resulting in praise or in honor. So when you talk about glory, you're talking about someone who gets the attention of the individual that will give praise and glory to him. We've been singing about the name of Jesus all day today. And uh, I'll tell you one thing right now, when you think about divine uh, uh, power, divine nature, God has so designed it for us to know who Jesus Christ is that we might give him the glory and the praise. Amen. We don't give man the glory and praise. We don't give an organization the glory and praise. We give all the glory and praise to Jesus Christ. So he says uh, he has filled us with the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. The word virtue is an interesting word because it means moral goodness. It means moral goodness in particular to the aspect of being modest and pure. So God has called us based on the knowledge of Christ who has called us. He has called us to glorify and celebrate all that he is in a way that is completely pure and moral and holy as we exalt all that Jesus Christ is. And you say, how in the world can we do that? By the divine power and the divine nature that God instills and develops in each of us. Amen. Then Peter, what he does is he uh, describes for us the process of growing and maturing. And he does that for us in verse 4. I'm sorry, verse 5. He starts to describe for us how this process works in gaining strength and maturity. First of all, there is a matter in verse 5 of gaining understanding. Gaining understanding. And he said, besides this, now I'll tell you, verses 3 and 4, I should even back up verse 2 through 4. If that's all we had in 1 Peter chapter 1, that'd be enough to, to fill our soul. And Peter says, now that was good. And I know you enjoyed it. But he said, besides that, I'm going to give you something else. Amen. Oh my God. I want to plug into that. Gaining understanding. Notice in five, verse 5, he says, Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. So gaining understanding. He starts out with faith. He has already stated that we have faith in Jesus Christ. And so he now describes, now your faith needs to be a not just experience, of receiving it, but your faith needs to be an experience that's worked out. So gaining understanding. First of all, faith. 
We need to gain and understand. We need to understand what faith is. Faith is a conviction or a belief respecting man's relationship to God or to divine things because he's talking about divine things. So if he's going to acknowledge their faith, their faith is based on their understanding and their connection with all that which is divine. It, it, listen, the faith is, a, uh, it is in reference to relating to God. And uh, we have faith that uh, saves us, and that faith that saves us is because it is designed to relate to the Lord. Uh, that Did I put that on the slide? No? Oh, well, sub point one. Uh, faith, relating to God. Relating to God. In faith, relating to God is conviction. Here it is. It is conviction that God exists. It is not this matter of questioning whether God exists or not. But faith that builds us and sustains us and enables us to experience that divine nature of God is based on the conviction that God is God. Amen. When the Bible says, in the beginning, God, that's enough. If that's all God gave us, when he gave us his word and preserved it for us, if all he gave us was Genesis 1-1, the first half of the verse, that all it said was, in the beginning, God, that's sufficient. Amen. That's sufficient to have faith. Why? Because faith is a conviction in respect to man's relationship to God and relating to God. It has a conviction that God exists and that he is the creator and that he is the ruler of everything. He is the provider. He is the bestower of eternal <laughs> salvation through Christ and so everything that deals with a divine nature is based on our faith, our conviction that God is God. Amen. Don't you let somebody try to rob you of the belief in your God. They, they talk about statistics about how many young people uh, leave church and go off to college. And within their freshman year, by the time they've done their first uh, year in college, they disbelieve everything that they were taught from grade, kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade uh, in their home and in their church. Don't you let somebody rob God from your heart. God has created you in his image and God has saved you for his glory and God has a plan and a purpose for you and that's what faith is, what enables <laughs> me not to stumble and fall to but have confidence and commitment and courage is the fact that God has instilled faith in my heart to know that he is real. Amen. So faith, that is in conviction about what you believe about God or man's relationship with God in reference to relating to God, but also to relating to Jesus Christ. Uh, conviction that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Amen. Uh, we can't, listen, we can't fudge the issues. If we're going to be stable, we're going to be strong, then we believe that Jesus is the Messiah and through him we obtain salvation and become or enter into the kingdom of God. It's through Christ and Christ alone. In John chapter 8 verse 58, Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. Amen. Amen. So he in Colossians chapter 1, he says that he is before all things and by him all things consist. Amen. Everything that we believe, what our faith is built on, is built on the conviction. Now, I may say this. A lot of people say they have convictions which are merely preferences. The preference you may change your mind about, but a conviction you die for. When you say, I believe that God is God and that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, that's what we stand for. And that's why many believers throughout history were executed on the cross and were executed and burned at the stake for their faith in Christ and their faith in their God because of the fact they had courage and they had commitment and they had confidence because they had experienced a divine nature through the power of God. Amen. And so how they do that? By faith. 
So he says here, um, verse 5, add to your faith virtue. So what's virtue? We have to be able to define these terms if we understand what he's saying. Virtue is moral goodness. It's particularly in reference to moral excellence or modesty or purity. Now, Paul writes about this. We don't, we're not going to read all these things, but in, uh, I don't know, what we have uh, 2 Timothy, we have Titus. Uh, let, let, let's look at Titus chapter 2. That's a good chapter. But Paul writes about what is virtue, uh, what is moral purity. And uh, uh, Titus chapter 2, in verse 1, it says, But speak thou things which become sound doctrine. That... There's a reason for it. I don't know, just recently, it just seems like God is just making me focus on one word. Focus on just little words that we read over like they're just fillers in the sentence. But he says this, Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, and here it is, that. In other words, there's a reason for it. In other words, there's a responsibility to it. To hold on to a sound doctrine. Why? That the aged men be sober, grave, temperance, uh, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Why? Because they're to be fulfilling the divine nature of God in this matter of virtue. In verse 3 of Titus 2, it says, The age of women likewise. Paul's brave on calling women aged. <laughs> I'll be read aged one and duck. <laughs> the age of women likewise, that they be in behavior is becoming holiness, not false accusers, not giving them much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober and to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed, young men likewise <laughs> exhort and be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound <laughs> speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of a contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Virtue. You read Peter and you say, wow, that's really exciting, a divine power, divine nature, and the great confidence and commitment and courage that Peter had. Boy, I want, to, I want to be able to experience that. You do understand that you have to have faith. And that faith has to add, have added to it virtue. In other words, your faith impacts who you are. Amen. Your faith impacts how you live. Amen. And it makes a difference. You say, how does it come out? By gaining understanding. And so faith, virtue, and then he says here in our text that we're to add to virtue knowledge. Now knowledge is an interesting word because it means a general knowledge of Christian religion. It means to have a general knowledge especially of those things that are lawful and unlawful for Christians. Paul said all things are lawful for me. But then he follows up and says but not all things are expedient. Or best. So oftentimes people want to get into a debate about whether a Christian should, I don't know what, you can think of all kinds of different things. Now, well, it should, it, I mean, the, uh, the Christian should be able to do this, do that. Well, they might be able to do that, but is that the best thing to do? Amen. That's right. The, the, what kind of a, There's a lot of things I could do as a pastor that people do that necessarily not necessarily is sin but it certainly wouldn't be a good testimony as your pastor Amen. and uh, certainly you would you I would hope that you expect more out of me than the average person I would hope that but I would hope also that you would understand that God expects more out of you Amen than the average person out in the world. Amen. So that they have somebody to turn to and someone to look to that they might be able to gain knowledge about what it is to be a Christian. 
Now, Peter's talking about divine power, divine nature that's going on here. And uh, he's making it very clear that there is a right way that we're supposed to live. And we need to live in accordance with that. So gaining knowledge, understanding. I, I, verse 6, I also, for the second point, put down. Can I try to lump these according uh, to what the emphasis is? Faith, virtue, and knowledge kind of fit together. And, and we need to understand what they are. Faith, virtue, and knowledge. We need to understand how that impacts our life and impacts others. So we need to be gaining understanding of that. However, the next two deal with control. So I put down here, gaining control. Not only are we to gain knowledge, but if we're going to be able to experience that divine nature, we need to gain control. Notice he goes on here and says, add to knowledge temperance. Word temperance. What is temperance? Temperance is simply self-control over all sensual and immoral desires. The whole issue about abortion, transgenderism, everything else that you're dealing with, homosexuality, whatever, that goes on in our society would be eliminated if if we uh, uh, learned how to have self-control. Divorce would be eliminated if we learned how to have self-control, be committed to each other. It'd be gone. Because these things take place in our experience because of the fact that people can't control themselves or won't control themselves. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, he said, I buffet my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should also be a castaway. We have developed a mindset in our educational systems in America that children cannot control themselves. We have developed a whole society of adults that live based on the fact that they can't control themselves. Well, bless God, in the Christian community, we can control ourselves. We have the Spirit of God living in us, and we do not have to live according to the lust of the flesh. We do not have to live according to immoral desires. We're supposed to add to our knowledge of what the Christian life is this matter of temperance. We control ourselves. And then he says, uh, add to temperance. He says to add to temperance, add patience. Patience in the New Testament is the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and suffering. Patience. In other words, you just hang in there. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 18, 15, verse 58, uh, 16, verse 58, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because you know your work is not in vain in the Lord. And so patience is this concept that you're loyal to your faith. You're loyal to your Savior. You're loyal to your life that is a Christian life. And no matter what comes in your life or what temptations may be in front of you, your resolve is to stay in control and add patience to that control. So gaining control. And then, now listen, this is all for one thing. It's all for one thing that you might, by the divine power of God, develop the divine nature. And so he goes on, not only do we need to gain understanding and gain control, but we see in verse 6 and 7, gaining a godly character. It's a building process. And so in verse 6 he says, add to and to temperance, patience, and to pray, patience, godliness. Godliness is just simply reverence and respect, piety towards God. Godliness is not so much what you do in your life as it is whom it is you respect. And we respect God Almighty. 
and we exalt his name. And so as I'm growing, going through this process of developing the divine nature of God, there must be godliness in my life. And that godliness is a spirit of worship and praise of the one who saves me. Then he says that we're to add to godliness brotherly kindness. In the New Testament, brotherly kindness. In the New Testament, the love which Christians cherish for each other as a brother. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, Be ye kind one towards another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Brotherly kindness. And you know, a lot of, a lot of people's homes are dysfunctional. Uh, my wife and myself both, we did not grow up in Christian, what you would classify as a Christian home. Uh, my mother was saved in my home, and that was it. Uh, Joanne's family didn't have anybody saved in it. And so that's the environment we grew up in. And then we got saved in 1979, and now we're supposed to live like a Christian. And we didn't even know what it was. We didn't even know what our house is supposed to be. But I can tell you this, in these different types of settings, there's a dysfunctionality that develops a hatred and resentment in society because of the homes that are dysfunctional. And then we get saved, we become a part of the body of Christ, and we do not know how to handle being kindly, brotherly kindness where we're reaching out to one another. We need to learn that because that is a part of the divine nature of God. You, you do understand God was very kind to us. Yes. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. He was very kind to us. And so if we're going to be godly, we're going to develop, add to that godliness, brotherly <laughs> kindness. And then he concludes... Uh, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Now, charity, you understand what charity is. Charity is used exclusively in the scriptures to express the spiritual bond of love between God and man and between man and man in Christ, which is characteristic of Christianity. Whether the love be viewed as in the soul or express outwardly. And so this matter of charity, charity carries with it a sacrificial uh, uh, love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so why did he give his only begotten son? Because of charity. And because of charity, he was willing to sacrifice his son for us. Our couples retreat we're going to have in October. The theme of it is sacrificial love. I'm going to tell you right now, the problem, 90% of the problems you have in your home, 90% of the problems you have in your marriage will be solved by living in light of charity. Your life is a sacrifice for your spouse. Your life is a sacrifice for your children. Your life is to copy and fulfill the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But that shirt certainly is not very popular when you start talking about that. But I can guarantee you that if you'll stop complaining about each other and start loving one another with a sacrificial love, it will make a difference in your relationships. It makes a difference in the church. It'll make a difference in the world in which we live. So he goes on, he deals with this whole thing about gaining understanding so we can gain control, so that we're able to gain a godly character, so that we might be able to experience what Peter did, confidence and commitment and courage, uh, based on the fact of the uh, moral, I'm sorry, the divine power and the divine nature of God. Now, here's the conclusion. He says, according to the glory and virtue. Glory in accordance with praise and honor. 
uh, as we go through this process of developing the divine nature of God, it gives us the opportunities over and over again to experience the glory of God and we can enter into praise and honor. But not only that, but there's virtue. The praise and honor, listen, and you're in the presence of God. You do not have the thoughts, I can't wait to get out of God's presence and go and be immoral. Much of the immoral problems that people have can be solved if they'll spend time alone with God. And so, virtue, moral goodness. The outcome, the outcome is a divine power of God that is in us that is creating a divine nature. And so we're supposed to be like Christ. We're supposed to be a testimony to the world. And I, I know this, we cannot, we'll stumble and we'll fall. We won't have confidence, we won't have commitment, we won't have courage unless we're willing to go through the process of developing this divine nature that God has so planned for us to have. What a great chapter. Amen. And so take some time and read through that and look over there's so much that we could cover in this chapter. I've preached so many sermons out of this chapter and I just said, as I was reading through it, I just saw another sermon <laughs> put together. But a call to virtue, a glory in virtue. God has called us to glorify him and by a life that is virtuous. How does that take place? By divine power, developing the divine nature of God. May that be our goal. May that be our desire tonight. Uh, to live in reference to the call to glory and virtue. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. What a gracious God. Uh, Lord, we, we stand uh, humbled in the presence of your goodness towards us. And I, I'm amazed, Lord, that you would allow us and so graciously outline for us this process of growing and maturing to enable us to develop the divine nature of God. I pray, Lord, you would just convict us. You would show us what areas in our life needs to be corrected and adjusted. Uh, God, I pray that we'll have a testimony that really does show forth the praises of the Lord, the glory and virtue of our God. Bless us tonight, I pray, this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing. I'll, uh, what are we singing? Lord, I'm coming home while we're singing. If you need to pray, why don't you come and pray tonight? Uh, what a wonderful passage. That you can out, God outlines it for us of how to become more like Jesus Christ. You come tonight and pray as God will lead you. Amen.
out there, and they won't let you out till you give them all. <laughs> uh, remember to pick up one of the new schedules. Uh, Joe, August the 29th, we're starting a new schedule. Nine o'clock in the morning on Sunday will be coffee. Nine thirty is Sunday school for all ages. And uh, 1030 will be our morning worship, only one service. We're getting everybody back together. And uh, we'll be live streaming that in person. Children's Church will be going on uh, at 1030. And then our evening service will be at 6 o'clock, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. If you uh, can help out with a Wednesday night program for the children, be sure to see uh, Pastor Duana about that. If you'd like to teach in Sunday school, or, uh, um, you know, we need it in Sunday school. And because uh, uh, Pastor and Mrs. Petrozello is going to be doing children's church. So we need uh, teachers for uh, children's Sunday school. If you'd like to teach in one of those grades, uh, let me know about that. And um, what was the other thing? Oh, Sunday nights. We want to start back up the Patch Club. So if you'd like to help out with the Patch Club on Sunday evenings, that way adults can come, their children can go out and learn some songs, be able to sing in church. I'll guarantee you this, if you don't get your kids singing when they're young, they're not going to sing when they're a teenager. You'll get them to sing when they're young, and they still won't sing when they're a teenager. It's like seventh grade, their mouths close, and their head falls. <laughs> Amen. I'm just joking. <laughs> anyway, make sure to get a schedule. We're going to be changing the things around, and uh, we're really praying. We've got some great things planned for the fall. Just get things rebuilt, moving again, getting people saved. There'll be soul winning at 930 on Saturday mornings, and so we want you to get plugged into whatever God's doing. Amen? Pastor, why don't I want you to close in prayer? Hope you got all that because it will be a quiz next week. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. Lord, our, our heart's desire, Lord, is that we would be changed from within. And that can only happen through the power of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells in each and every one of us. Lord, we believe your promises. We know the Holy Spirit dwells within. And Lord, we want to be changed. Lord, we want to experience the power of God working in our lives as we surrender to you. So help us, Lord, to live for you. Help us to live in the power of Almighty God. Thank you, Lord, for all you're doing. Thank you, for, Lord, that we're going to be opening up all these things and getting back to Sunday school and all these different programs. Lord, but we need your direction. Lord, we don't want to take one step apart from your will and your leading. So help us, Lord, as we prepare. Help us, Lord, as we get ready to, to start doing these things again, Lord, that it may all bring honor and glory to you. We pray for your blessing now as we're dismissed. Lord, take us home safely this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.